afternoon is Gerald Livings, who is a professional jeweler living in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, Gerald first started studying jewelry making uh, when he was doing historical reenactment as a teenager and ultimately it became his career. Uh, and so his interest in jewelry manufacturing processes is informed by uh, the necessary mechanics as well as a love for the period. Um, his interest in aglets uh, started in 2014 when he saw a YouTube video of somebody <coughs> making aglets and thought, that can't be right, and intended to write a two-paragraph note. Yes, for a newsletter. Yes, for a small newsletter. It is much more than two paragraphs now. So we're going to hear about that. Uh, techniques for manufacturing aglets in 16th century England, comparisons and conjecture. This is an apple store. I'm not sure how to get it to the port from that. I love that better start. Uh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. And uh, let's start by asking Choyans who here wore, wore shoes today. <laughs> Pretty much all of you, okay? Well, yeah, watch you. Uh, if you wore shoes, there's a really good chance that you wore aglets in the room with you today. Um, and you probably have a bunch of them at home, but you'll figure that out. First, I want to say thank you for attending my uh, uh, presentation. My name is Jerry, and uh, my presentation today will be about aglets. Uh, <coughs> Uh, I'd like to visit my website later, uh, where you can download a copy of my paper, as well as find additional resources about access, several pages, videos, and other stuff. Basically, uh, they're small metallic combs used to finish off the ends of laces, cords, or you know, lace tubes, uh, uh, and they were used, you know, on mid medieval periods to uh, hold your clothing together. So, now most of them were used, meant to be used on everyday clothing, and were very simple. But in later periods, they could get. 15th, 16th, 17th century, like the uh, illustration from the lady we just saw in the picture, very fancy, holding sleeves together. Um, the metals they were made from varied. There are different types of aglets. Uh, they're very, very interesting. Now, an aglet placed on either end of a cord makes what is called a point. So basically, that's point. And if you look at your shoelaces, that counts as a point as well. Um, most were fancy, uh, were, were simple and plain, and some were very fancy for showing off your wall. Uh, there were many different types of aglets, the metals they were made from varied, the shapes varied, and the attachment methods of attaching the aglet to the cord varied quite a bit. Now, this is the current definition of aglets uh, as it stands today. There's three different types. I've simplified it a bit because the current system is very complex and vague and hard to understand. So I'm going with just how the seam is formed on the first three aglets. The first type, the seam just comes up and they meet the edges of the metal in the aglet blank and that forms your uh, seam, and that's for type 1 aglets. Type 2, both sides of the seam fold inward to grip the lace or cord. 
and type three aglets, uh, one side of the seam overlaps the other, and uh, one side may or may not come down to hold your lace support. Kind of a little boring, I know. Now, type four aglets are cast. These are my proposed additions to the system to make things easier uh, because a lot of these are not talked about. Type four aglets are cast, forged, or made from uh, solid metallic materials. Type five aglets are manufactured from non-metallic materials such as bone, stone, pottery, and amber. Type six aglets are purely decorative and uh, maybe similar to other styles in manufacturing, but they're not usable, they're just decorative, like the uh, aglets on the uh, ladies' dress. Okay, now there's a lot of different ways to make aglets. What we know of manufacturing, we know a little bit from some woodcuts. Uh, but it's mainly illustrations of paintings and woodcuts, and we do know the following. They were made from copper and copper alloys, uh, which would be brass and bronze, also from jewelry, metal, silver, and gold. Uh, they were decorated in many ways, to include enameling, and then some of gem of various sorts. Uh, they could also be, uh, have patterns stamped in them. Uh, when they were riveted, usually type one, but sometimes type two and three angles, the rivets would be iron, copper, and brass. Uh, aglets made, were made by craftsmen who specialized in these, as the demand would have been very high and an efficient manufacturing process would have been needed to meet the, the demand because everybody had them. Uh, to, uh, like the gentleman in the slide before, it would take several dozen to wear just that normal clothing every day. Now, the first type of aglets, I'm going to talk about the type 1 aglets. Those are made by taking a uh, metal blank and folding it over a mandrel and burnishing the uh, brass, the aglet blank, into shape. Okay. That's fairly simple. And then that is put onto a cord after it's made. Type 2 and type 3 aglets are formed around the cord uh, as the act was made, and they may or may not be riveted as well. Here you can see where somebody is cutting the blanks with a huge shear, which I really want one. And then uh, <laughs> this gentleman over here is uh, making the aglets and attaching them to the cords at the same time. I'm pretty sure it's uh, type two or three aglet that is being made. Okay, now uh, the next picture. One of the things that uh, I questioned when I first started doing this is, were pliers used in the manufacturing of aglets? Well, uh, looking for something else, uh, I ended up getting some aglets from a uh, museum uh, in England. They sent a few over, but several of them did not make the trip intact because they were too fragile. This is a sample of a type two aglet uh, that had broken, and you can see where the seam is on the inside, and you can see distinct marks from my sketching where somebody used basically needle nose pliers to crimp that metal edge around the fabric or cord before it was formed into a round lace. Uh, most people want to see that, uh, but as a jeweler, I'm conscious of making sure that I don't leave marks like that on stuff. So it's very, very plain that you don't do that. Which, this is the first evidence I've seen of laces being uh, made with pliers. Come on, come on. There we go, okay. Now, uh, most of the illustrations surviving do not show the manufacturing of type 1 aggregates. There are illustrations showing what seem to be type 2 and type 3 aglets being made and attached to cords. Now one thing that is clear that anvils were definitely used in the manufacturing of type uh, 2 and 3 aglets. And made a uh, one here and this works extremely well. So I am confident that those are accurate descriptions or depictions 
of type 2 and type 3 activants being made. Now, now the tools to make aglets are quite varied, depending on the type of aglet being manufactured. Uh, if you're doing mainly type 1 aglets, you need a mandrel, a way to cut the metal, a uh, uh, burnisher to burnish the aglet blanks around the mandrel, and that's pretty much it. Type 2 and type 3, similar tools, but you do need a small brass hammer and an anvil. Now, um, uh, okay. now, one thing I did find interesting is that aglets were one of the few things where men and women uh, were able to take and work on them together and side by side. Uh, th this is a very bad translation on my part because I don't speak French, but uh, there are some guild regulations that said that the judgment of the parliament for widows of doers of agulettes uh, remarried to another man, they can continue the business. So, so uh, a widow could continue making aglets and selling them and continuing that while she's married to somebody else, which is very interesting. Now, what are the technical skills needed to make aglets? Well, they can be taught fairly quickly within a matter of a few days, but they're going to be very similar to some of the very basic skills needed to make jewelry. You're working with very small, fine metallic objects, uh, and then using rivets and stuff to attach them to cords, all the while keeping things very polished and nice. So it can look good. Now, trying to figure out how to these were made, uh, you're having to work back. Uh, so by knowing jewelry, you are able to work back and figure out, because of the form, you can work back and figure out how to get that form. Uh, and then, okay. Sorry, I'm getting a little lost here. Mentor, well, one thing is, is clear. Most basic tools would be a. Sorry, sorry, I'm getting lost here a little bit. Okay. Now, uh, uh, going back to making the aglets, it's easy to take and uh, uh, figure out how to make them because you're working back. We know that the use they need to be at, and so we know how, what we need to do to get to that point, and that informs us by practicing and trying out different processes, how they would have done it back then. Uh, back then they wouldn't have had things like sandpaper and rotary tools and stuff. So that allows us to understand better how people worked and manufactured stuff and did processes back in the day. And also, uh, uh, by doing that, we can better date where the aglets came from. Uh, by knowing how to make something, we can date it better. So a lot of times when aglets are dug up, they're basically you know, dated like our early medieval era to the post medieval era. It's like that's very broad. By being able to figure out how to make them and narrow our time down, we should be able to find aglets with something and be able to better date the objects that were found with those aglets. So, and we go to the next page. Okay, summary. Okay. So, I'm going fast here, sorry. Uh, so, manufacturing aglets. Basically, okay. uh, there are small items, pretty much something everybody owned, and uh, then and now. A lot of you have them at home. The tools are very similar, similar to those used by jewelers of the past and of today. And while the techniques vary a slight bit, they're fairly uniform to them being similar in use. Function drives form. So. Now, one thing that is notable is a lot of people will say, when you read the literature, it's like, oh, rivets were 
uh, rivets were used in that case. Nobody ever sewed them. It's like, well, they were attached in a lot of different ways. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence uh, that uh, aglets were returned to jewelers uh, for the fancier ones uh, for repair. And that kind of begs the question, they were probably sewn on because removing an aglet that was riveted from, to, from a cord to a cord and then having to repair it and put it back on the cords with rivets, very hard to do. And it's going to do a lot of damage. So there is some evidence that uh, aglets were sewn. A lot of them were compressed on the ends. Uh, and uh, basically, you know, very simple. And uh, well, let's see, at this point, I'm going a little fast, but uh, I'd like to invite you come up, grab a card from me. You can download this presentation at my website, livingsinjewelers.com aglets, and a lot of other different uh, materials as well as as well as a long paper I wrote about aglets. So, uh, thank you very much. We have 15 minutes left and we need to use some of that for Q&A, so may I suggest that we have about 10 minutes of Q&A and then people can, can uh, get their close yep. look at the aglets? It's not so much that I found unusual, it's, uh, uh, from the little bit I know, and I will admit I'm coming from this from a different viewpoint than a lot of art historians. Uh, I don't see a lot of images of women in the jewelry field or doing craftsman-like stuff like that. It's usually the guys, and to find regulations where, where it states plainly where it's like, oh, a woman can do this as well. It implies that the woman was working with her husband before that point. Because it's not something you can just, you know, it's like, oh, the husband died, so I'll just take over the business. I have no idea how to do it. She would have to have been working with him to do it you know, before him. Well, just to follow up on that, I think that may, maybe um, it would be helpful if you went back and looked at that again, because I think it's um, there's evidence to show that women would often work side by side with their husbands in a variety of different industries, including um, uh, uh, textile, wool, um, book production, especially when you get into uh, printing presses, women were really important in that. And um, Etienne Boileau was one of the first, um, he did the first survey of the uh, um, that takes the jobs in Paris in 1261, and he lists women doing different Oh, okay, so. great. Uh, yeah. Grab one of my cards and email me sure. you know, with any links or information. I'd be happy to look that up and add it in. Thank you. Another question? This is for Jerry. Um, at the very before, while you were being introduced, uh, they said that you read an article on aglets and said, oh, that can't be right. Would you like to... Uh, I, 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 I think we'll excuse him from naming. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it was a, uh, you know how you'll like uh, go on the internet and you'll uh, look for something and three hours later you're looking something totally yeah. different? Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of those type of readings. I saw a short YouTube video of a gentleman making aglets. I was like, well, what are those? And so I watched it. and. He's sitting there using pliers, bending these pieces of brass around a um, uh, metal rod and everything. And just <coughs> all my years of being a jeweler, I just looked at that and went, that can't be right. You know, and so I went and did a little research on it. But, well, this is kind of interesting. I'll do a little more research. And it was one of those situations where it just kind of took off. He's like, every time I, every time I, went to find something to answer a question, I found five more questions, you know, and it's just kind of spread. And you did find evidence, though, yes, for on, some. Yeah, on type two and type three pliers, I think, well, not being a professional or academic, I think I can say conclusively 
that 95 percent that yes, fires were used in the manufacture of that particular item. The, the, the reason I ask is also because just yesterday I was looking in the Museum of London um, where they were showing a, it's basically a, a jig mm -hmm. uh, where you would put the eye, the cloth in the eyelet mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the cloth would go through a hole in this jig and you could hammer down the eyelet. To get I have one right there. Okay. <laughs> I made it an illustration in the book and it yeah. worked perfectly first time. Cool. It's like if whoever, uh, and that crimps down the end. And yeah. it crimps down the end and you can see the end. It's about 30% closed. Melanie? 